You are watching Co-op for Two, broadcasting live from Champaign, Illinois, Sunday afternoon, 3 p.m., May 21st, 2023. And the day has finally come for us to get the solution to our first case from the play-by-mail game called Dear Homes. I have the solution in front of me. We're going to talk about it. We're going to open it live together. We're going to read the solution. Before we read it, we're going to get everyone on the record what your theories of this case are. Then we'll read the solution, and then we'll spend some time talking about it. Was anyone right? What do we think of it? Was it fair? Did it disappoint? We'll get to all that in a minute. Let's do some bookkeeping first. I can see we've got... 12 people in the channel, all the regulars, and some new people as well. Everyone's getting their last theories in. Um, okay, let's do a little bit of bookkeeping first. Um, I just posted on the channel my spoiler-free review for the Be the Detective game, The Duel, that we played over three sessions. I quite liked it. You'll see my review is very positive. We had an interesting thing. The designer has come by and left a comment saying that they really enjoyed watching our playthrough after the fact, which is always a nice bonus. It's certainly not guaranteed. We've had some pretty good luck with authors watching our playthroughs and enjoying watching someone play. We've had a couple of, uh, or at least one bad experience where an author wasn't happy. It's always a little bit touch and go. There's been an interesting controversy in board game news over the last 24 hours or so, and I thought I would use that as an excuse, talk about it briefly, but just um, get on my soapbox a little bit here. So does any, everyone know what the controversy is? We've got an interesting group of people here because mm, maybe a third of the content now on the channel is cooperative board games. And then recently, over the last couple of years, mostly these detective mystery games. So I'm a little bit removed from the board game YouTube uh, world. But... Um, the controversy involves a channel called Quackalope, which I've talked about before. It's a up and coming, one of the big up and coming channels over the last two years, run by someone who's sort of aggressively ambitious in this space, making a real business of it. And um, the controversy involves paid content and some leaked emails with a company that makes a new Kickstarter game called Eon's Trespass, Eon's Odyssey Trespass. Anyway, the emails came, come, came out with uh, that channel trying to negotiate uh, a $7,000 fee to record more positive videos instead of the ones that were already recorded. They tried to coordinate the production of a whole bunch of videos. It's a little more complicated than that, but essentially the negative videos went up instead of the paid videos. <laughs> if it was paid, they were going to be positive videos. Uh, a little more complicated than that, but I've talked before about how the incentives for the board game YouTube stuff are so messed up 
that uh, all of the um, all of the companies, it's Kickstarter. Everything is Kickstarter, and the money is to be made on Kickstarter. And so the paid Kickstarter previews are the videos that get watched and make money. And so companies are very incentivized to pay YouTubers to promote that content. And uh, even the best of the YouTube board game YouTubers are just basically getting around it by saying, okay, we're not going to do a review of this game. We're going to call it a Kickstarter paid preview. We're going to say good things about it, but we won't call it a review. And even if you've got a board game channel and you want to be popular and you don't take any money, you're still completely dependent on getting early access to games from companies and the companies will only send games to people who rave about them. So even if it has nothing to do, it's like a survivorship bias. Even if you're the most ethical person, the system will weed out people that say negative things about games and only the only ones that will survive with access to new games are people who just say great things about them. So it's all messed up. The best thing you can do, in my opinion, is find the board game people who are asking, who are running, who are funded by Patreon only, who don't take any money from board game companies. At least that's the best thing. I think that's the good way to support. I think the Patreon model is a fantastic pay model in general. You go, you fund the creators whose work you like. And then you're the customer rather than these companies. Okay. Yeah, Dice Tower. So the chat is talking a little bit. The Dice Tower and Tom Vassell is one of the few exceptions because he gets sent early access to games even because he's big enough, even if they don't know he's going to say good things. Anyway, but it's complicated. It's messy. Um just take people's opinions with a grain of salt and don't buy into the hype. Okay. That's a little bit of a um, diversion here. The other thing we've been doing on the channel lately is playing this game es Escape from the Asylum. You guys somehow, a couple people in this channel have convinced me to play more of it. So I guess we're going to be playing a little bit more of it, even though I don't really, <laughs> haven't really been liking it. But... I guess we're curious to see if the narrative changes in some way. So maybe we'll play a little bit more of that next week, this coming week. If you want to help decide what bigger games we play next, um, go to the About page of the YouTube channel and jump to the Board Game Geek Guild for this channel and check out the Game Q thread. One more thing. Uh, I'm supposed to remind you to give this video a like. If you want to see more of these kinds of videos, if you're liking the Dear Home series, whatever, if you see a video, if you watch a video of mine and you like it, give it a like. I It, it makes me feel better when I see the likes. And on a related note, the channel, as of now, as of today, has 1,998 subscribers, 1,998 subscribers. So two away from 2000, which is quite exciting. It's certainly not a number I thought we would ever hit. So it's kind of fun. All right. What else? I guess um, we're almost ready. Debbie says in the channel, I'd like to see a playthrough of Mugbook. So I posted a review of Mugbook, which is this rare 1984 games that 1984 game inspired by Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. A couple people want to join a playthrough of that. And I think we should do it. Somehow, because of that time frame, it makes me feel like that should be like a Saturday morning thing. Saturday afternoon. I have very fond memories of watching cartoons as a kid getting up on Saturday morning. The kids today with YouTube and no network TV don't know what it was like in the 80s when you would wake and before that decades i guess for you would wake up as a kid saturday morning cartoons that was it you get up 7 a.m you could watch cartoons for five hours on every channel it was amazing 
Anyway, I'm not sure why I connect that with Mugbook, but that's what we're going to do. So we're going to find a Saturday afternoon to play Mugbook. Should be an interesting sort of trip back in time, maybe next weekend. All right. So now, dear Holmes. Okay, so here's what my itinerary for today is going to be. There's no Patreon for me anymore. We tried it when the channel started. Everyone told me you cannot start a channel asking for Patreon money. Greg and I started it. I made a little blurb about why you should support us. Mm, there were actually a couple people who were really kind enough to throw their, to, to, to jump on Patreon, but it just wasn't worth it. It's, this is not the kind of channel that is going to get much support. You, but thank you for reminding me. I did want to say that all of the games we play here, I purchase myself. I, a couple of people on the channel have sent me a gift certificate, which I've used. I've traded a game with someone on the channel too. I appreciate it, but keep your money. I don't need your money. Maybe, you know, who knows? In a decade, I'll start a Patreon on this channel if I run out of money for the games. But as long as it's a hobby... And I would buy these games anyway. To me, having people to share them with is just a bonus. So you keep your money. You support some other channel that needs it, that where it makes a difference. But I have no relations with any of these companies. I subscribe to Dear Homes with my own money. And I feel a lot better doing these reviews and playthroughs, not having the influence of getting any free games or anything like that. Okay, so... Now, here's my plan for today's session of Dear Holmes. I want us to recap our theories, our major theories. If anyone um, has a theory they haven't expressed yet in the comments or here, please state it in the channel now, anytime you want. We'll have a little bit of a vote before we start. To, but I want everyone on the record, and I see the channel is telling me that someone has been guilted <laughs> into subscribing and we're now at 2000. Okay, that's very sweet of you. All right, so I want you all to get officially on the record with your vote. It's very easy in retrospect to think that you got it right. In fact, I'm just reading this great book by Daniel Kahneman that I've been recommending and Nobel laureate economist. And... Um, one, he talks about a whole bunch of cognitive biases, but w absolutely one of them is that you misremember uh, that you thought things, like if, you, if something happens and you try to think back, did I predict that was going to happen? You give yourself credit when you shouldn't. So we are going to have the vote system here, and I want everyone on the record, no claiming credit, for something you didn't vocalize. I've done that plenty of times myself. I say, oh, I thought that too, but I didn't mention it. If you didn't mention it, you it was such low confidence that it doesn't count. You gotta be willing to put your money where your mouth is. All right, let me just reset here. Um, I also made a list of sort of the interesting things that I wanna see how they're resolved. And then I've got Nicola wrote a list in one of the YouTube comments uh, about questions he wants to see resolved. So we're going to have our theories. We're going to quickly look at, maybe we can look at those questions afterwards. Um, all right, so you can feel free to start typing your theories in the channel, but I'm going to open the vote here for anyone who wants to get your vote in a little stats here. Just type vote and then whatever, however you want to summarize your vote as concisely as possible. Rob, um, who's been helping out uh, in the discussion of High and Low, my detective game, which is marching ahead on the Board Game Geek Guild section for this channel, made a little poll and I tried to put up a link in today's stream for it, but one of the things we'll talk about when we finish that we'll think about is what how, what format we want to play these. This is our first case in Dear Homes, and we're still figuring out what's the best way to do this. And I think Rob set up a nice little poll. It's probably too late to get much participation on, 
but maybe for future cases, we'll try to more formally collect the different theories. So let's see what we've got here. Let me see, can I put this on a different screen so it's easier to see? Okay, so we've got two votes for the chef so far, Debbie and John Kingsbury. Elaine Covington is for Alphonse. That's what I am. I'm team Alphonse or team, <laughs> team psycho rich killer. Uh, Nicola is for Jackie Dows. Christopher is for Monsieur Lefebvre, the chef. So that's actually five votes for the chef because Debbie and Tina, Rob and John are all voting for chef. And Lee is voting for chef. And Christopher Jorgensen is also voting for chef. And Alex P is also voting for chef. Lots of votes for chef. Emily and Elaine and I are Alphonse. Jonathan is Derry and Dow's framing Alphonse. Alphonse kills Derry. So I'm going to talk through some of these votes. Now that, see, Ginny hasn't voted. Invisible Man hasn't voted. So let's just talk a little bit about these. So the chef is a compelling one because the chef has no alibi. The chef is known to be in town during the town murders and is known to be awake during the initial stabbing of Bundo, the dog. So Chef has no alibis. And the Chef Lefebvre was one of our early suspects because of some very suspicious stuff going on with his wife. We're told his wife is dying from consumption on the estate. No one ever sees her. He's having an affair, but everyone knows he's having an affair and thinks it's fine. And most interestingly, he's very protective over his special meals that he makes her with special ingredients. So there was an initial theory that he was poisoning her, but she's taking so long to die. And there was a theory that maybe he was on this expedition and something to do with dogs. So one half the theories with the chef are that he's trying to poison his wife and that's, and he was testing poison on the dog. Then the other theory was he's trying to save his wife and he's trying to get the dog liver to save her, stuff like that. Okay, so there's the chef. Um, the Alphonse theory is our other person who has no alibi. Alphonse, he, he refuses to even give an alibi because he's royalty. He's the Lord's son. And he's definitely known to frequent the places where the dogs in town were killed. And there's two pieces to the, that way for and against Alphonse, depending on how you cut it. Um, half the channel seems to think that Alphonse has an alibi because he's seen in the kitchen at like 11 a.m. Whereas our best timeline for the dogs were, was like 10.30 or so. So half the channel thinks he couldn't have made it back in time. And I am of the belief that it's almost perfect timing for him because he hit that dog on the head on his way home. And the other place where the Alphonse theory cuts both ways is the fear of dogs. He's deathly afraid of animals and dogs. And I believe it was Ginny who first proposed that his fear of animals, rather than the, the constables think, okay, he's so afraid of animals, he won't even go near their cages. So obviously he didn't go into the dog cage and attack the dog and attach, attack these other dogs. But Ginny flipped it on its head and said, okay, he's so afraid of dogs that he's like sort of proactively trying to get rid of them. And what I loved is I love this idea. I imagine in my head, this Alphonse taking these late night trips to the bar at midnight at 2 a.m. and all these irresponsible town folks letting their stray dogs roam around where they could attack him, right? And that his fear of them has made him sort of go on the attack. And so this is this theory that he's fashioned a poker and he hit one and he left out poison for the other and he stabbed Bundo through the chains. 
So I really like that motivational theory that Alphonse's fear is being transmuted into his attacks. And he's trying to get people to take better care of their animals or punish them for letting their animals go stray. Okay, now the Jackie Dow's theories, that's our last little piece of the theories. Jackie Dow's is the town kid who's the butcher's delivery boy. He was due to meet Violet when the poison dog was found. Where the poison dog was found, he was supposed to show up to meet Violet. We know he was caught robbing from Worthinger's, the confectionery shop where the dog that was hit on the head was found. And we know that he had access to the estate because he was supposed to be making a delivery for the chef. So he's got, he's right near the scenes of the attacks. And he's a troublemaker. He was st seen stealing, and but then he was ran out, ran out of town and caught the previous night before Derry was killed in the alibi. So those who believe it was Derry have to have a split theory of the attacks that Dow's killed the do attacked the dogs but that a different person killed Derry. And so that's what we're seeing here. Well, Nicola is not giving a separate theory, but Jonathan is. Jonathan's theory is much more complicated, which is that Derry and Dow's were working against Alphonse and Alphonse killed Derry. So it's a very interesting theory. It's, the, pro the other problem is that Dow's has, like what's his motive for doing this? That just that he's a rotten kid? It's odd. And Emmy is sticking with one of her early theories about the chef planning to poison his wife, and so he's creating all this other stuff. It seems a little bit hard to believe. Okay, so those are the votes. They're locked in. Everyone's made their votes and said in the channel um, any other specific comments. I can see in the channel that... Let me just... Uh, I'll leave open the vote, but let me just switch away from it for a second. So I can see in the chat the discussion of whether there were two separate attackers, a dog attacker and a dairy killer. It's quite intriguing. Um, and then no one has given us a explanation for the bear cage lock, which is tricky. But my theory of the case goes something like this. Alphonse is desperately afraid of getting attacked by an animal. He sees all these stray dogs running around town and he's coming home drunk and the dogs are barking and going crazy. And he takes one of the fireplace pokers. This was a great theory someone came up with, sharpens it as a weapon. He stabs Bundo through the, through the fence and he sees now that the dogs get locked up because previously their cage was barely locked. And he's like, okay, this is working. I'm gonna get all these dogs in town taken care of. He goes to town, he puts out poison for one stray dog. He hits another stray dog on his way home that's barking around him. And then my theory is that on the last night, we know there's an Irish wolfhound stray running around right outside the inn where we know that Alphonse likes to hang out and Alphonse has come out Alphonse has come out of the inn run into this dog and is attacking the dog torturing it or whatever and Derry who also likes this inn comes out runs into him surprises him they get into a fight and Alphonse ends up killing him and then the use of the fireplace poker instead of a knife matches some other stuff, matches one of the best observations anyone made in the channel that overhearing a conversation about a lost poker, lost game of poker was really a missing poker. I really love that theory. Um, okay, and that, so that's my theory of the case. 
And if I had to guess at a theory of the bear cage shavings, it's, it would be something along the lines of um, Alphon, either totally unrelated and or true that the bear was chewing on his cage, or Alphonse messing with his, testing out his poker his uh, and, and creating shavings that way, or maybe testing out the lock so that he could convince the zookeeper to replace the lock, or maybe even that the zookeeper is lying about why the lock was replaced, but that Alphonse pressured him and said, you get a new better lock for that bear. Okay, and then there's some more theories here about our original theory about a cassowary attack. All right, so let me see. We're taking a long time before we open this reply, but that's the way we're doing it. So let me just quickly look at my notes here about things that I want sort of answers about. Or there was the poker conversation. A number of us have picked up that there's the melting of the blacksmith is working earlier, earlier than normal. So we had a theory about was it was someone melting down the fireplace poker? Was it the fireplace poker? There's some disagreement about the reading of the coarse hair where the dog was. There were some theories about was it a werewolf? Then you've got the chef poisoning his wife or saving his wife, the Alphonse fear and kill theory, the Derry and Alphonse know each other from the war theory, and there's some blackmail. These are things we've all discussed before. There's the Dow's kills the dog, someone else kills Derry theory. There's the debate about the Alphonse timeline. We haven't talked about all the theories of Perky the dog. Why was he hiding in the chef's room? There were lots of theories about this. So these are sort of like clues. And it's going to be interesting to see how the game resolves them. Are they red herrings? Are they key? Then one of the other debates we had was whether the attack on Derry was just him being in the wrong place at the wrong time, as I think, or people think he was meeting to blackmail and someone planned to kill him. I'd We have yet to have a, a convincing bear lock theory. And then there was my other theory that the vet is doing all this to get work at the estate, which I really liked until where we got hung up here was how the hell does the vet get onto the estate since they're big, tall, gated thing. I'll remind you that after our first letter, we came up with a pretty nice theory about the bear lock cages, which is that someone was trying to create a disturbance on the estate to bring a crowd of people so that they could rob the estate. And then, the remember, the bear lock happened a week before, so my theory was they were trying to set the bear free first. That failed. Next week, they tried Bundo. All right, so there's that, and then... I've got Nicola's questions, but we'll save this. We'll save the questions. These are questions Nicola wants answered for him to be satisfied with the solution. All right, <laughs> we're almost ready to open this. This is where all the thumbs down and unsubscribes happen when I take too long to do this. Let me remind you how surprising this has been though. I thought the way this Dear Holmes works was the first letter. There was no way you could figure out what happened, but you could take guesses. By the time you got to the third letter, it would be very clear what happened. Fourth letter, super clear. Everyone would know. Remember, the game wants you to send in solutions before a solution is posted. Uh, but we got to the end, and we don't. no one really knows what happened. So... What's going to be in this, the fifth letter, after the four real ones, is going to be the solution from Sherlock Holmes. And presumably, this, this got delivered a week ago, so lots of people have already who subscribe to Dear Holmes have already read this. We're going to read it together. Now, something did occur to me. I want to propose it. And I want to propose a new name for this genre. Is it possible that 
we're being scammed. That the way this company actually works is they write the clues without a solution. They send the four letters out. They solicit submissions. They pick the one that's closest to the true solution, but really they're just taking someone's solution that is most convincing to fit these insane facts. And they're claiming that that was the solution intended all along. Now that is a brilliant idea. And I want to propose a name for this new genre that either they've created or I've created. And I'm going to call that glitch mystery, the glitch mystery genre. And the idea is you write the facts of the case, the clues, and you just make them all convoluted and contradictory and bizarre. And you don't have a solution pre-written. And then you just try to solicit a large enough group of people to come up with the craziest enough convoluted theories and you pick one and you say, yes, that's the answer. So there you have it. That's my theory, glitch mystery, but we don't know what it's going to be. But it is an interesting idea. And it is interesting to think that you might use an AI to come up with, you could use chat GPT to come up with some convoluted set of facts and figure out the solution ahead of time. Teresa is asking if this is going to be the only stream tonight. Probably. Okay, so I can see this is signed by Sherlock Holmes. So it is indeed the solution. Here we go. So if you are a subscriber to Dear Holmes and you've been waiting, you can open up your letter now and read it along with me. Here we go. So here's Sherlock Holmes. Remember, this is the first time we've ever seen this. So we don't know exactly what to expect. I can see he's writing to Bradley, the person who was writing to us. First July, so about a week later after Bradley's last letter. Dear Mr. Bradley, you initially expressed concern that these mysterious attacks were too trivial for a detective such as myself to investigate. Au contraire, my friend. This case was a satisfying puzzle to piece together, and I need not remind you the attacks on animals are treated as a serious offense in this country. As it happened, I was even invited to investigate these incidents by the Buckinghamshire police. Oh, this was not until 28 June. You were wise to involve me as soon as the first attack transpired. Had you not, a new victim would have soon turned up on the Chalfont estate. Oh, it sounds like it's the chef killing his wife. All right, let's see. Now let me set out my modus operandi in solving this odd case. When your first letter arrived, it imparted two crucial bits of information. The first, there had been an attack on a dog. The second, more salient point, was that it appeared somebody had attempted to get into the bear cage in Lord Chalfont's private menagerie. I will return to this detail. I will return to this detail. As for suspects, I theorize the attacker would have come from the Chalfont estate given the limitations on access that you described, but that was far from conclusive, and even so, I could discern a few, mo few motives. Mr. Bertram and Lewington both could have had access to the animals, I thought, and it was possible for Mr. Allison to have snuck into the estate. Of course, none of these men seemed to display a strong motive. Your later letters, however, rapidly shed light on the Chalfont estate and its surrounding community. From its start, your second letter, dated 24 June, complicated matters. If the attacks had been carried out by the same individual, then it appeared their motivation was unrelated to Lord Chalfont, as the latest victims were not his animals. Somebody had clearly been compelled to assault three hounds, 
and possibly a bear. But to what end? Reviewing your two missives, I considered the possibility of Mr. Allison's involvement. Although he might have easily had the opportunity to harm Mrs. Mercer's dog and Mr. Howard Grant's, it seemed highly unlikely that he would have carried out the crime on Lord Chalfont's estate, even if he had and had not been spotted by anybody. I surmised poor Bundo, and no doubt the uninjured hounds, would have been reminded of his scent. Knowing that Mr. Allison's arrival did not stir the animals, I could dismiss him as a suspect. This left me questioning Jackie Dowd. The delivery boy Violet Harper had mentioned, and scrutinizing two individuals whose connection to the Pheasant Inn was dubious under the light of recent circumstances. Alphonse Chalfont and your assistant, Mr. Derry, both would have had the opportunity to commit all three of the crimes thus far, and indeed, both could have accessed Lord Chalfont's animals without causing a commotion. Still, neither displayed a reasonable motive for wanting to commit such a crime. Dow's, on the other hand, I thought was worthy of surveilling. Then came your following letter of 26 June, which finally laid our villain's motive alongside several possible others before me. Going through the dramatis persona you so kindly provided, I saw nothing relevant to the crimes in your description of Lord Chalfont. I could see unusual, if not dubious, characteristics in his son Alphonse, but a fledgling revolutionary is unlikely to advance his cause by attacks on animals. His background in biology piqued my interest, but these crimes were far from experiments. And had Alphonse truly wished to conduct any sorts of experimentations, he could have easily accessed a laboratory. This, taken with the knowledge of his fear of animals, led me to dismiss him as a suspect. The zookeeper, Mr. Lewington, despite his gambling, did not appear to have substantial motive either. In fact, he seemed concerned with protecting Lord Chalfont's menagerie. This left Lord Chalfont's secretary, Mr. Horace Adalgi, the butler, Mr. Summers, with his demanding mistress, your assistant, Mr. Derry, whose treatment of animals you observed to be objectionable, the chef's assistant, John League, and the chef himself, Monsieur Lefebvre, with the ailing wife. Upon first reading the name of Adalgi, I thought of a case involving a solicitor, also Adalgi, from some twenty-odd years ago. My dear associate, Watson, has since reminded me that the similar names are no coincidence. Lord Chalfont's Mr. Adalji is the brother of the aforementioned solicitor who had been given a seven-year sentence after being falsely accused of several gruesome attacks on animals. He was only freed after a respected writer raised concerns with what he saw as a miscarriage of justice. I assisted with some of the investigative details. As for the present, I could see nothing in your descriptions of Horace Adalji which would imply a motive for the attacks. Mr. Summers had the opportunity to attack the Chalfont animals, but he had been on the estate overnight when the attacks in town occurred. Mr. Derry, too, became an unlikely suspect with this letter. Besides a lack of motive, he continued to work with Lord Chalfont's hounds throughout the investigation. Much like Mr. with Mr. Allison, the dog's would not have allowed Derry to go on so casually about them were he the attacker. Thus, I was left with two candidates, Monsieur Lefebvre and his assistant John. John, as did many of his fellow staff, had ample opportunity to commit the first crimes. Nevertheless, his presence in the Chalfont kitchen on the morning of 24 June makes his involvement in the latter assaults improbable. Simply put, he would not have had the time to carry out two separate attacks in town on that same morning, all the while returning to the estate unnoticed. 
and readying both himself and the kitchen for breakfast. This leaves but one individual who moved undetected until I read your report on the Chalfont staff. Your description of Monsieur Lefebvre and his ailing wife provided me with our villain's motive, and indeed, the key to this whole matter. First and foremost, Lefebvre was unaccounted for on every single occasion marked by an attack. Indeed, the role reversal recently taking place in the estate's kitchen was not as innocuous as it seemed though I am sure Mr. League would be quite pleased to continue taking charge. You also noted in your third letter that Lefebvre had taken part in the disastrous exploratory mission led by Douglas Mawson before the Great War. This brought to mind one of the very first odd details you had reported, that it seemed as if somebody had attempted to get into the bear enclosure. Mawson's expedition resulted in a most unfortunate accident and the deaths of several men, though Lefebvre, among others, lived. It was later learned that some of those who perished only did so after consuming their canine companions in an attempt to survive. It is now more commonly known, I presume, especially to those who survived the ordeal, that the entrails, particularly the liver of certain animals such as dogs or bears, can have a toxic effect on humans. Now, let us return to the nearly broken lock to the bear enclosure, and the multiple wounded hounds, and to Monsieur Lefebvre. Considering the man's colorful background, I am certain he was familiar with the peculiar nature of canine and ursine liver. And as you well know, dogs and bears were singled out from all other animals on the Chalfont estate, in spite of the presence of possums, raccoons, crocodiles, and more. Add to this his dalliance with the scullery maid and the fact that Lefebvre fed his wife separately and would grow angry if anybody so much as touched her special meals, and our culprit seems clear as day. Had I any doubts then, they would have been swiftly assuaged on receipt of your letter dated 29 June. Mr. Derry's death suggested that the man was not responsible for the ongoing crimes. Rather, I posit that he witnessed our true culprit in the act and bravely intervened as he stumbled out of the Pheasant Inn early on the 29th. Knowing that Derry recognized him, Lefebvre felt more than physically cornered, and though Derry was once a soldier, he was inebriated and facing a knife. The rest of your last letter only continued to support my hypothesis, as Mr. Bertram's dog was discovered in, and rescued from, that is, Monsieur Lefebvre's room. This, I need not remind you, is the same Lefebvre, who is known to call on both Mr. Grant and Mrs. Mercer, the owners of other dogs attacked. The Buckinghamshire police were initially skeptical of my findings. Their chief inspector perhaps does not have such a keen interest in obscure poisons as I do. But after a proper introduction, my theory was taken under more serious consideration. They have since verified that... Thankfully, Catherine Lefebvre remains alive and arguably well. With regard to Monsieur Lefebvre, by the time you have read this letter, I expect he will have been escorted from the estate by Sergeant Milton and his men. Whether his relationship with Miss Blounce was truly sanctioned by Madame Lefebvre or not will soon come to light. Nevertheless, the man was eager to hurry along his wife's sickness. It is unclear the extent to which her ailment is a result of her husband's actions, but there was some peeling of the skin, and I understand she confessed to occasional nausea as well as intracranial pressure. These are uncharacteristic of her consumption, yet not indicative of severe poisoning either. I theorize that Lefebvre has been working with small or insufficient quantities of his special ingredient. 
hence his recent attempts to harvest larger amounts. Madame Lefebvre's condition should be reviewed by a medical professional in any case to ensure she is receiving adequate treatment. I would be pleased to dispatch Watson to help in his capacity should she find it agreeable. You need only send work. Mr. Bradley, this affair, though sordid and unfortunate, could have been far worse were it not for your intervention. I commend your dedication to the law and to protecting those around you who might not be able to fend for themselves. If you should ever need my assistance again regarding Lord Chalfont, his hounds, or otherwise, make no mistake, it would be my pleasure to lend my mind. I remain... With best wishes, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. So, there you have it. It was the chef. He was trying to poison his wife with dog liver. And he did stumble on Mr. Derry at the Pheasant Inn and killed him to cover up. So, before we get thoughts, or you can start giving your thoughts now. Let me see if can I show a vote or it's too late. A vote's gone. Go to vote. Oh no, there it is. Okay, let's see. So a whole bunch of people did guess chef correctly. Mm. Debbie and Tina, Rob and John just said chef, no further details. So you're on the honor system, whether those details made sense to you. Same with Christopher Jorgensen. M.E. said the attacks were to throw suspicion off him. That's not quite right. I it sounds like the solution to the game was that he was trying to get the liver from the bear and the dog. He just never bothered to. And why did he poison the dog? You, I guess maybe you poison it. You don't care if you take its liver, if it's poison. But why did he not actually take any of the livers? Not only didn't he successfully kill them, he didn't steal any of their livers. All right, so um, let's see. Let's let's see what some chat thoughts are, and then. Will um, I'll give my thoughts. Okay, let's see. Um, John says, good job. Anyone who voted, for, everyone who voted for the chef. Debbie says, okay, obvious theory was correct. Still a bit unsatisfying. Where was he getting dog liver from before the attacks? Emmy says, mixed feelings. Not the most satisfying. Not terrible. Not great either. And says, yes, the chef was obvious from a meta perspective, but insane explanation from a story perspective. And everyone's agreeing that it was weird that he didn't kill any dogs. I mean, we did consider this idea. Of, as soon as we read the part about the chef's wife, the channel quickly came up with the theory that he was poisoning her. Um, and then a bunch of other theories. One theory was he was killing the other animals as a distraction so that when he poisoned his wife, the suspicion wouldn't fall on him. And we actually did consider that he was getting the liver to poison her or whatever. But it didn't make much sense because he didn't actually take any liver. That was weird. Um, also, Emmy points out that Alphonse was not discounted by alibi, but by motive. Yeah, I mean, Sherlock Holmes discounted a bunch of people that that seemed very flippant to me. He's like, ah, he was scared of dogs, so he couldn't have done it. I didn't like that. Or he he said that Alphonse wouldn't have done it because it wouldn't have advanced his aristocratic plans, but that wasn't our theories. Um, Nicholas says, I don't think Holmes' solution is really satisfying. It doesn't make that much sense. I agree. Another odd thing is that some of our favorite points were not even picked up on by Holmes or not even part of the solution. The iron poker was completely wrong. No relation to that. It was just a knife. The whole poker thing was a complete red herring. 
There were also there was also some weird things in the letter, like Holmes said, "Hey, remember that bear lock that was nearly completely removed?" But that's not what we heard. We heard that there were some shavings next to it, which the guy suspiciously claimed was the bear chewing on them. We weren't told that the lock was nearly broken off. And yeah, he doesn't even mention the fact that Derry, I guess he says once Derry was killed. And then the other thing was he came up with the vet theory and said, well, he could have got, he could have snuck on, which is how we ruled him out really. And then it just says his motive, he wouldn't have attacked the dogs, but we had a much clever, more clever motive, realize clever explanation for his motive to get a job at the estate. But then his motive, what ruled him out was that the dog, one of the dogs he attacked, he had been providing free service to. So that wouldn't make sense if he was trying to get money. So... I, Rob, Rob says if the wife was consumptive, she would die anyway. I don't think he's... I think the idea is that the wife wasn't consum consumptive, that the wife was being poisoned. But why poison her with dog liver? Yeah, I agree with that. Why not just poison her with something else? Okay, so let me give some thoughts here. Uh, I really enjoyed the style of the... I like this I like this system where Holmes sends his solution. I like how it was written. I like the style. I like the length of this explanation. It's a nice long explanation talking about all the suspects and how it led up to his final theory. So everything about the mechanics and format of it I liked. But I definitely was not satisfied with this explanation. I think it was less satisfying. Well, the fact that so many of the people in the channel figured out it was the chef is a good sign that maybe I'm being too harsh on it. Although I think none of us are really happy. Uh, let me see. Jonathan says, look at Alex's point. Let's read it here. The dogs didn't react to Lefebvre either. Yeah, that was a very weird comment from Holmes saying, hey, it couldn't have been these people because the dogs would have reacted. And I guess Alex is saying, hey, the dogs didn't react to the, to the chef either. Which I thought was a very weird way to rule, very weird reason to rule people out, too. Lefebvre was also in the kennel to carry out Bundo. I don't think that's, I'm not sure that's right. I, I think they brought the dog, I'm not sure they brought the chef to the kennel. But I'm not, he definitely helped them put on the platter, but I'm not sure he went into the kennel with them. Debbie says, yes, he did. So, I guess we're all in agreement that this isn't a very good solution, that we're not convinced by the reasoning here. It definitely seems very far-fetched to me. And yet, enough of you picked up on it that you did think it was the chef. And Rob points out, we never got an explanation for the poison dog. Yeah, no explanation at all for the poison dog. Nicholas says, yes, there's the statement about the chef coming with us, coming with them to the kennel. Emily says, maybe the writer realized he'd written himself a, in a, into a corner and had to figure out a conundrum corner, had to figure out a solution last minute. Yeah, it definitely does not feel right as a solution. Okay, but I have said over and over, and I maintain 
my position. Far better to have a convoluted, complicated, contradictory case that promotes hours of debate and discussion than a simple one that's easily resolved. So for my money, um, this has been a fun case. And I'm, I, I'm of the belief with these games that you can write your own solution. Like if you have a better, if you like your solution better, stick with your solution. You don't, you're not bound by this. And that's how I'm going to imagine it. I'm going to imagine Sherlock Holmes was fooled and he's had an off day, a little too much opium. He just phoned this one in. He did not think it through. And I'm happier with the idea that Alphonse did it with a fireplace poker, that he fashioned a weapon and he's taking revenge on the dogs and the townsfolk who are letting their dogs roam about. But it's been startling how engaged everyone has been here playing this game and coming up with theories. Um, but it does create a little bit of a problem going forward in that we're all now suspicious that there's all of our, all of the effort that went into coming with theories and all the discussions were sort of motivated by the idea that there was going to be a good, clever solution here. And the fact that there wasn't means people may be a little less a little more hesitant to invest time trying to think of solutions. But you tell me, do you think, I mean, I was so surprised by how engaged everyone was in the comments and on the live streams in trying to come up with theories and play through this. What is your, I mean, I thought this was going to be a terrible format for the channel, these games, but it turns out that it was quite conducive to having discussions. But what do you guys think? Has this turned you off it? Have you soured on this game? Are you looking forward to the next one? Nicholas said, we carry this experience to the next case. We might need to assume that we should do some research about historical facts. Uh, and it says, Chef didn't have an alibi that was obvious, but no one can come up with a sane explanation for a real motive. And yes. John says, Jesse, how do you feel that you can use the internet to help you come up with a solution? Did any of the setup mention that you should use external sources? No, I don't remember hearing anything about that. People have pointed out, I mean, someone, I forget who it was, very early on, pointed out that some of the names in this case are names we've seen in, in past Sherlock Holmes and in real expeditions. So we do have a good team of people that are good at research and history. So I guess we'll have to take that a little more seriously. Um, it was also pointed out that the company who makes this game, Dear Holmes, also makes a mail-based historical letters service where you sign up and you get a new historical letter each week, a reproduction of a historical letter. So clearly they have some interest in history. Debbie says, I can take it or leave it really. I'll try the next one and hope it's better. Emily says, even if the ending was unsatisfactory, I still love the experience. The writing style was compelling and it was fun theorizing. That's how I feel. The writing style was great. It was great fun theorizing. It was great fun debating with the channel, different theories. Um, but we can see the channel is a bit divided. Emmy says, I'm going to see what the next couple are like, but if the next two or three wrap up like this, I'll spend less time trying to think of solutions. Ginny says, I like the historical parts. Rob is saying the way I feel. The goal in future cases will be to create theories better than the official one. That's how I feel about this. Like, there were a couple of moments in this that I feel like were wonderful insights and little twists. The one was the reading of the poker. To me, that was such a beautiful, elegant 
insight that someone had, I forget who it was, I want to give that person credit, that we overhear them talking about a loss in a game of poker, and we a fireplace poker was mentioned as a pre as a possible weapon, and the idea that we misheard lost a game of poker as a lost poker was so it was almost too, it was too good to let go of it was too good not to uh, adopt so it's a shame that it wasn't part of the official solution but it's a fish it's part of my solution it's become canonical for my story and i also really liked the i liked the moment when Ginny suggested that the very thing that was making us exclude Alphonse could just as easily be seen from the other direction as his as a, a very valid reason to suspect him. His panicked, desperate fear of animals and dogs that you would think would rule him out for being the one who attacked these dogs could be exactly what caused him to walk around with a weapon in town and strike out at any dog that might approach him. So Rob is saying that basically my approach, like we should attack these just as we have. And if our theory is better than the official one, then we stick with ours. Or maybe these are glitch mysteries. And if we had submitted our solutions ahead of time, maybe that would have been the official solution. I would like some proof that this solution was written before people started submitting solutions. I would like someone to offer me some official proof that this solution was written ahead of time because I have my doubts. And uh, someone pointed out earlier that 1924 would make Sherlock Holmes older than he should be. Is that right, though? Sherlock Holmes would walk around in the 1890s. But maybe we're dealing with a senile Sherlock Holmes or a fake Sherlock Holmes. No one has seen him. He's just writing by letter. So I think if you disagree with the solution, that's okay. Um, remember that different people write different cases. So it's not the same person who, who will be writing our next case, which we have no idea what it will be. We'll be playing that next week. Alex says, for Jesse's theory, and now Alphonse has escaped. Mr. Droy forged his horseshoes. I like the theory about the lost Miss Poker. Earliest cases were 1880s. Holmes was 70. A bit early to be seen out. I don't know. In the 1800s, people aren't living that old. Debbie says, seen out is going too far. Maybe Watson wrote this, just pretending to be Holmes. Maybe Holmes has died or is just dictating and not really following the case very carefully. All right. To summarize, amazing material for debating and really struggling with theories. Actual official solution feels like not convincing, full of holes, important stuff missed by Holmes, and our favorite elements weren't even in play. So our solution is better. Maybe we'll start offering alternative solutions for people. Although, and we should consider whether we want to start submitting solutions. Um, I wonder what the winning answer turned out to be. I'm sort of curious. Maybe we can talk about that next week. So hopefully next Sunday we'll meet again at 3 p.m. That's the time that everyone seems to like best, although there is a poll if you want to vote differently. And hopefully next Sunday, 3 p.m., we'll have the first letter of a new case. We'll see if it's as compelling. Anything else to talk about? If you've got some ideas about how we should format, format these live sessions, these discussions, better ways to go through the evidence, should we have a Google Doc where we collect the different theories and run have a running poll? Um, let me know. You can post a comment on this video or on the Board Game Geek Guild.
If you watch this not live, but after the fact, I'd love to hear what your group, if you've played it completely separately from us, there's definitely a group think that happens. I would love to know your thoughts about the solution, whether it convinced you, did you have a different solution? Let's see. I do like that they had a reason for discounting each suspect, just not happy with the reasons they gave. I agree with that. And Tina says there wasn't going to be a good solution. Don't rake our win away from the chef people, Jesse. <laughs> and it says, Rob, as a point, it's hard to do when the facts don't match. And they add facts in the solution, the bear lock, Adelji's brother, that you didn't know before this. I don't think this mystery is fair. Yeah, okay, I think that's reasonable to complain about. Keeping notes might be useful next time, yeah. Just think of how much better it was that there was no easy solution. If there had been an easy solution, we would not have had the fun we've had. We would not have had the fun we've had. I still do, do not buy the chef theory. All right, well, we're going to end it here, an hour, five minutes. That's not so bad. Thank you for joining me. This, it's so, one of the revelations of this channel has been how enjoyable it is to go through these things with a group of like-minded people. I just can't imagine doing this stuff alone. Um... So with that, I'll see you all next week. Or I guess I'll see some of you later on this week. Uh, when we, If we figure out something we want to play during the week, maybe back to the asylum. Maybe I shouldn't be so quick to jump away. I forgot my, my uh, philosophy here. We can sit here and talk. People have more, more things they want to say. I can pick up my coffee here. I feel like, well, we have the vote. You voted chef. There's nothing wrong with that. But just be honest with yourself whether this explanation of what the chef was up to coincides with yours. Maybe we should have had people get on record whether they thought the chef was trying to save her or poison her because there were some debates. And... um I, it's, it's, this, it's very hard to believe the chef was needed liver to poison his wife and never took a single liver. I mean, this is a pretty terrible murderer. And then somehow he managed to kill Derry. There were other reasons I discounted the chef. I didn't see how he was going to be in town to kill Derry. He was a late, he was an early sleeper. Demi says, I honestly don't know regarding motive. None of them made sense to me and still don't. I don't know. You, this, this is not the right solution. Holmes did not solve it. I don't even think this is from Sherlock Holmes. Can someone check his signature? Look how shaky it is. I don't think we're really dealing with Sherlock Holmes. I think this is someone else. Check the typewriter. Is it the same typewriter that Bradley used? Maybe Bradley has, form has faked these letters. Look at this. I think it's Bradley's typewriter. Look at that. It's the same typewriter. What are the odds? That Holmes and Bradley have the same typewriter. I think we've cracked this case wide open. I think Bradley has written this letter. Mm, actually, it's a different typewriter. I see now. Similar. But look at that M. The M is different. Hmm. Oh, I caught him.
I thought I caught Bradley faking a letter from Holmes, but actually, now that you look at it, the font is slightly different. All right. I'm going to jump the gun. That just means Bradley's more clever than we gave him credit for. He's got two typewriters. <laughs> no, I don't think it's Bradley. But I do think... I do think it's not Sherlock Holmes. It's someone Im uh, impersonating Holmes. Very cleverly using his style of writing. I think we need to check that signature. Where's our handwriting analysis? Do we see any stress in the way he's written, he's signed it? I feel it looks like there's a little stress. It's not as smooth as it might otherwise be. A little bit of jaggeds on these long lines. Any other thoughts? Is there anyone in the channel or in comments afterwards who have played more than this case? So this is our first case, all of us here. This is my first case that I've gotten in the mail. I've subscribed for a year, I believe. So we'll be playing every Sunday. But is there anyone in the chat who's played previous cases? And if so, how does this compare? Don't give us the answer in case we could get <laughs> in case we can get back letters. But I'd like to hear how they compare. If you read this, um, if you watch this after it goes live, I'd love to see a comment uh, from someone who's played other cases other cases in the Dear Home series and can let us know how this compares with them. Is this how it normally is? Rob says, compare his signature to the one in the intro letter. You mean in the welcome to the whole system? And we could compare it to Peter Bradley's. Mm, let me see if I have the other letter. It's a good idea, though. Because Holmes did write to us. Presumably that was really Holmes that was writing to us. Let's compare. But we don't know for sure. Okay. Assuming it's the same Holmes. I do note that the logo letterhead is the same. But it's not the same letterhead paper. He's got it laid out completely differently than this. All right, what about his typewriter? That does look like his typewriter. Look at those, look at those Y's. The Y's look the same. 
Those look like it's Holmes's typewriter or Watson if Watson is writing it. All right, let's see signature. Hmm. Well, that looks quite a bit different. Of course, it's hard to know how how variable someone's signature is, but boy, that's a very different looking G, isn't it? This is just a normal curving G, and this one goes out and has a little loop back. And look at this T. Short on the left, way long on the right. Here, just a little bit. Doesn't dot his eyes on either case. He looks reasonably similar. Has he done something here with a line? Is there a line here? A horizontal line at this running through it? S looks like it could be about the same. A looks a little suspicious. He's got a curvy K here, and this one doesn't look curvy at all. Here we've got a connected H and O. Here we've got an unconnected H and O. And that's a pattern he sometimes does. It's a weird looking S too. Inconclusive, but I do think it pays to make a call to Scotland Yard and have them stop by 222B just to make sure 221B, make sure that that last letter came from Sherlock Holmes. And Tina says, I saw on their website they post the solution that other players posted. Do we know when? It will be interesting to see what the person that won have written. Yeah, let's take a look at that. Uh... I said chef planning to poison, but the reason for the animal tax was wrong. That was the key mystery. I was hoping for a clever detail. I still can't get over how dumb the chef was to draw attention to what he was doing. Yeah. I will check and report about the solutions that they post. So when we meet next week to go over the next start of the next case... I'll see if we can get access to some theories anyone posted. And we says, have to run. Thanks for doing these. Jesse, it was a lot of fun. Look forward to the next one. All right. Are we I think maybe we've, we, 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 should, we should end here. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining me. I'll see you on the next video. And thank you very much for helping the channel get to 2,000 subscribers. I'll see you next time.